Okay, good morning everybody. I want to thank you again for joining us this morning and we're always happy to bring everyone another installment of the Proceed series of COVID-19 webinars. So with that being said, let's get right to it. We do have a stacked agenda for today's webinar with a couple of newcomers that I'm very happy to introduce to you in just a couple moments. My name is Jason Flynn and I'm the Director of Human Resources and Client Services for Prestige Employee Administrators. Andrew Lubash, founder and principal of Prestige, joins us today along with our tax manager, Carol Sawyer. New to our webinar series is our partner, National EAP, which is an employee assistance program. Julie Prisco is the National Director of EAP Services, and Aaron McCown is the Director of Corporate Development and Training Services at National EAP. I am certainly happy to share the podium with each and every single one of them today. So as we get into the agenda for today's webinar, uh, Julie and Aaron with National EAP will be starting things off by talking about the psychological safety effect for employees returning to the workplace. I know that we've spoken about return to workplace in prior webinars. This is a little bit of a different spin on it, and uh, we're happy to have them here to talk about that with us today. From there, I will be talking about travel advisories that are in place for, in place for some states throughout the country, while Carol will then, then and pick it up from there and discuss the presidential executive order that was signed this past Saturday, as well as a brief update on the Paycheck Protection Program loan forgiveness report uh, that Prestige is creating for clients. Lastly, we'll end the webinar with some frequently asked questions, as we typically do. Um, as a reminder, I just want to say that all participants will be muted throughout the webinar. However, if you do have a question, I urge you to use the Q&A feature within the webinar and direct the question to the panelists. We will do our best to answer all the incoming questions, and of course, a copy of the presentation will be available uh, in the COVID Resource Center of the Prestige website following the webinar. At this point, I'd like to hand the reins over to Andrew Lubash, who would like to say a few words. Again, hello, everybody. Uh, another week has gone by. Um, it's been a pretty interesting week. Um, and again, as uh, we will continue again next week and try to get back into that legislative uh, what's going on. As we know, the four executive orders were signed um, over the weekend by President Trump. Um, the first had to do with extending the enhanced unemployment, and again, this all begins on September 1st, and Carol will talk quite a bit about it, um, the, extending the enhanced unemployment at a reduced amount, but not, you know, it's kind of a meet halfway. Uh, you know, the House wanted 600, the um, Senate wanted 200, so now they're at 400. Um, obviously, the deferral of Social Security tax uh, by on the employee side is a bit hot topic and something that you really must pay attention to um, because there could be some liability to the employer, and Carol will again go over that as well, as well as the moratorium on evictions and the deferral of student loan payments. But again, we will go into that later on the uh, later on in the the webinar, and then obviously next week and the week after, as things evolve even further, we'll continue to uh, bring back Seth and Malcolm, who is plugged in to Washington as anybody we know, um, and we'll bring this up to date. Um, unfortunately, what I think this was to try to bring our legislators back to the table, um, but obviously, um, for some reason, uh, I guess, you know, their differences, they have uh, not really negotiated. Um, we thought maybe that the executive orders would bring them back and hopefully get a, a, a the next piece of legislation passed that would benefit all of us, but again, they seem to be a bit gridlocked. One thing to note also that the executive orders can be withdrawn. They are not permanent, so that's something to talk about as well. Um, today we're going to bring a national EAP. Um, Again, this is much more important now than it's ever been before. Obviously, with the pandemic, um, this is having a mental toll on, you know, on business owners, on employees, on families, um, in all different, uh, from all different angles. Um, some of the phone calls that I've been receiving uh, are heart-wrenching. Um, obviously, there are um, sometimes few outlets to talk to somebody. Um, again, meeting with a mental health therapist one-on-one -on -one today in person seems to be more difficult than ever. Um, but the EAP program that Prestige offers uh, is second to none. Uh, again, 
instead of me going into really explaining what everybody does, I will turn it over to National EAP. But again, um, right now this again happens to be, like I said, an area that I think um, being, you know, to be offered to employees that do need assistance, do need someone to talk to, do need advice. Um, again, it's not just work-related advice. It has, it can be with family. It can be with, you know, just outside influences altogether. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Julie, who's going to start. Um, she's the director of National EAP. Um, again, anyone, as always, I said, anyone has any questions or comments, and a lot of you are taking me up on that offer. Again, obviously, my direct line is 917-258-0223. That will bypass our switchboard and go right to my extension. My cell number is 516-680-5021. And as I say every week, I only have one phone, and I do answer it. And uh, my email address is a lubash, A-L-U-B-A-S-H, at prestigepeo.com. Com. So again, if anyone has any comments, anyone has any advice they can give us on how to do something better, um, any criticisms, uh, you know, anything that we're doing well, so we continue to do it, so we don't stop. Um, you know, my ears, you know, my my ears are open, my lines are open. Um, I put this in, I put the data out there for you guys to take advantage of it. So, um, you know, without further ado, I'm going to go back on mute, and as I say every week, my entire staff will clap. Um, so, Julie. It's yours. Thank, thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Jason, and thank you, uh, everyone at Prestige, for having us today. We're so um, honored to be a part of your webinar, and we've been working with Prestige for so many years now, and you're a great partner of ours, so um, we're happy to be able to work with you on this. Um, National EAP is an employee assistance program that Prestige offers to um, their organizations, and really the goal is to support employees with personal issues in their life, as well as work-life issues that they may be having. It's really a win-win for employees and organizations because oftentimes if you see that an employee is having a personal issue, you start to notice the effect in the workplace. And so by having an outlet that employees can address um, concerns that they're having with uh, behavioral therapists, uh, you do start to see the ROI in the workplace. You see the increase in productivity, the morale, and so forth. Um, so we've been doing a lot of work, um, you know, especially through COVID, um, working with our clients on some of, um, you know, the various areas of mental health issues and behavioral issues that have been coming up. We've been seeing a lot of anxiety, um, a lot of grief, depression, um, you know, through our individual calls, and we've been doing, um, you know, webinars with our organizations as well. Um, so uh, I also have. Erin McCallum on the line with me, um, who is our, our training director at EAP. Erin, I don't know if you want to introduce yourself and um, maybe talk a little bit about, about our training for today. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Julie. And hello to everyone. Thank you to uh, Jason and Andy for having us here. As Julie said, we're so glad to be here with you. We've worked with Prestige for a long time. And this issue, especially as Julie was saying right now in relation to COVID, is something that you know, really hits us near and dear to our hearts because, um, Jason, if you want to go to the next slide, um, I just want to introduce the topic that we're talking about today, which is creating psychological safety for the return to the workplace. And so often when we're talking about COVID and coming back to the workplace and or even keeping people there, we're talking about the physical safety. But what we're seeing at EAP and across the country is the increased need for psychological safety and access to mental health services. And even more so right now as um, COVID spikes in different areas and here in New York, we're trying to get back into the workplace. There's so much unknown and uncertainty and stress that's around for people that is really creating a sense of unknown and it's driving up symptoms of anxiety and depression. And when you think about it, especially now as schools are reopening and we're going back into the workplace, we've been told for months, don't be around people. Stay home, don't do these things. And now we're being asked to go back out and do them. And that's really scary. And especially for those who have health concerns or loved ones with health concerns, there's reason, there's reason for people to be worried. But what we can do as employers is help to create the stage for people to feel safe and returning, and there's some concrete things that we can do for that. 
and also help to build cultures of empathy within our workplaces. So that way, if someone is uncomfortable, they know that they can speak up and say something and or they just know that it's okay and it's normal. And that's what we want to do. It's not that we can fix it, but we can help set the stage for people to feel safe and understood in processing these things. Um, so if we want to advance to the next slide, Julie's going to explain to us a little bit more about what psychological safety actually is. Yes, and I think so much during COVID and the return to work during COVID, we're seeing a focus on physical safety, right? Which is so important, of course. You know, we want to make sure that we're taking everyone's um, safety into account, that we're having everything cleaned, that people aren't sick um, when they're coming in, uh, that, you know, we have hand sanitizer available and so forth. And so there's a, a big focus on physical safety. Um, but what is sometimes neglected is what we call psychological safety. And, you know, as I mentioned before, COVID-19 has brought about so much anxiety and fear and changes, right? There's been so many ups and downs and changes um, going on, you know, from uh, being out of work to, you know, having a peak in the virus to, um, you know, things getting better to, you know, not knowing which way things are going. So there's just been a roller coaster of emotions. Um, and people feel uncertain and they feel um, insecure. And, um, you know, now going back into the workplace um, with all this anxiety, it's so important that as HR and as leaders and as management, we want to set the stage for employees to have that psychological safety, right? Um, and in order for them to feel psychologically or emotionally safe, um, you know, employees need to feel included. They need to feel that they are in a safe area to be able to contribute with others and to be able to learn. Um, and so as HR and as uh, leaders, we have the opportunity to be able to set that stage for them, right? And um, really the biggest piece is that, you know, that communication, um, letting them know that this is a safe environment for them. And um, if they have concerns, if they, um, you know, are worried about something, if they're unclear about something, that it's a safe area for them to speak up and to communicate. Um, and they see this through you, you know, as the leader, as HR, you know, communicating with them and um, really modeling a collaborative um, space for them um, and just assuring them that they have that as well. And um, Jason, if you want to advance to the next slide, Erin's going to talk a little bit more about communication and transparency um, as it relates to this as well. Thank you, Julie. And yes, the communication and transparency is key. And again, we know that we don't always have the answers. This is a new ball game for all of us that we are navigating as we go through. But the best thing that you can do is keep up with constant communication. And this is something that at EAP we've been talking, and I'm sure Prestige has as well, been talking about since the beginning back in March is you have to keep up, keep your employees up to date with what's going on. Um, if people do not get information, they make up information. And it's not that they're making it up to be malicious or difficult, it's that they're making it up because they're nervous and they're trying to figure out and create, and create a sense of safety and understanding for themselves. So they're going off of either what they're making up or they're extrapolating based off past experiences. So make sure that you're telling your employees what you're doing to keep them safe. And if you tell them once in a video chat, send them a follow-up email. Have it posted around the office when people come back into work. Have the managers review it in their one-on-one -on -one meetings. Continue to go over that information. Because right now, um, people are very heightened, as we've mentioned. So they're not going to hear things the same way that they always do. They're going to have trouble digesting that information. So you want to make sure that you continually repeat the same information in different ways so that way people can understand it. And of course, keep them informed of new protocols. Uh, this is something that goes along with what we were just saying about keeping people updated. But I want to call this out because let people know what your, inform what your protocols are going to be. Do not assume that they know that you, would, you will be doing temperature checks or that you will be having people fill out a daily health att attestation. Whatever you're going to be doing, spell it out. 
um, in, it's, even if it's things that are on the back end that your cleaning company is using new products or they're using enhanced methods, tell people what they are. Again, people, if people do not see it in front of them, they might assume that it's not happening. So you want to make sure that you're letting people know that. And that's something that I've heard in some of the client calls I've picked up here at EAP is people worried about these things and going, well, I don't know if my company is doing health checks. I don't know if they're doing any of this. And so we continually tell them to go back, speak to your leadership, speak to HR, and ask them those questions. So be proactive about that and make sure people know. The more information that people have, the more secure that they feel. Again, repeat those messages in multiple ways and always address the elephant in the room. If your company is facing a big issue, maybe right now it's how are we gonna handle remote learning and work from home? Or how are we handling people who have kids that have to go to school and we, they're gonna be in school part of the time and remote the other? Let your company know or your employees know that you're addressing these issues. And even if you don't know what the answer is yet, because you may not, say we are aware that this is a problem. We see you. We are figuring out how we're going to work with this. If you're open to feedback, let people know that you're open for suggestions. But talk about those things. Because otherwise, again, this leads to a sense of unknown and uncertainty, and it can really lead people to feel unsettled if we don't talk about them. And as a company, to be able to keep morale up, and right now one of the biggest things is to be able to let people feel secure in their position, let them know as much as you do know. And if you don't have answers, that's okay. Be transparent about that. People respect that. Uh, Jason, if you wanna advance to the next slide, Julie's gonna talk to us a little bit about how to be an empathetic leader. Yeah, and, and this is a really uh, key part of the, the psychological uh, safety that we talk about is the empathy, the empathy piece, um, because um, you know, we're going to be noticing a lot of different reactions from employees that are coming back to work, and you may start to notice some resistance. You probably have already for some people, or that people may get defensive, right? Um, and I've spoken, you know, with other HR representatives and um, and management who are saying, you know, here we are, um, you know, working so hard to get things in place and to really ensure everyone's safety and get everything set up and to be met with, you know, this resistance and this hostility, you know, it, it could be, um, you know, a little disturbing for them. And so I think what's important is, you know, rather to then, rather than feeling defensive um, about the resistance that you might face is to see it as a normal part of change, right? It's a normal tendency for people to resist change. It's scary. Change is, is always scary. It's something different. It's something new. It's something that people have, have to adapt to. Um, and a lot of times this resistance and this defensiveness that you may be picking up on is really just a, a fear-based reaction, right? It's how people are responding to fear and anxiety of coming back in, and it's not something personal against you. So um, I think, you know, noticing that and taking that step back and saying, all right, this person's, you know, really, really nervous here. Like, that's what all this resistance is coming out. What can I do to make them feel safer? Let me have this conversation with them, right? Um, and rather than, you know, shutting them down or getting resistant, um, asking them why, you know, you know, tell me a little bit more about what's going on. Tell me about some of the concerns that you're having and let it be a safe area for them to talk with you about it. Now, listen, you know, it doesn't mean that you're going to be able to, um, you know, do everything that they want you to do. You know, they may have ideas or concerns that you may not be able to do. And that's okay. You know, you don't have to commit to doing everything that they want to do. All you have to commit to is listening to them and letting them have that area to be able to speak with you. And that goes a long way. Just them knowing that they have your ear and that they can talk and that they're in an area where they're going to be listened to and going to be met with that empathy rather than the defensiveness um, really, um, you know, can make more of a successful return. You also remind them of what resources are available to them. So, you know, having concrete resources, um, you know, protocols that you may have in place. Certainly, you know, if you do have an EAP program, that is a great resource, um, you know, in returning to work to remind them, listen, I, I hear that, you know, you're having a hard time with this. I want to remind you of your EAP program. It's confidential. Um, you know, they can talk you through this. 
Um, and you can even reach out to the EAP if you have someone that you're really concerned with, and we could, you know, talk with you about ways that we could you know, help someone on a unique situation. So um, really just, you know, having that empathy, listening and providing resources is going to go a long way. Um, and then the last piece that Erin's going to talk about um, on the next slide is training management, which is uh, the next big piece. Absolutely. And one thing I wanted to add to what Julie was saying about the defensiveness or the anger that you might be seeing is that at EAP right now, and I'm sure Julie could speak to this a little more, is we have been seeing an influx in mandated referrals um, for people who have been having poor performance issues and behavioral issues. And um, one thing that we always know at EAP and that we've seen in our experience is that generally this is a symptom of something else that's going on. It's not that the person no longer cares about their job or wants to get that done. It's usually a sign of stress or something bigger that's going on. So we are seeing an influx in that. So that empathy to be mindful of watching for changes in your employees and um, especially even if they're working from home and they've been doing well for a while, now they might be starting to slip. So really being mindful of that and keeping that in the back of your head when you start to see those issues going, is this, you know, an issue of the person no longer caring about their job or, or is there a bigger thing here and we should be getting them some support. Um, but yeah, so training your managers is the next biggest piece in this and we beg you to do this. Uh, your managers need to fully understand the changes that are going on. If your managers are not fully on board or understanding the new protocols that are going to be in place, what are the policies? What are our quarantine policies going to be? Who's going to be working from home? Who's coming in? How flexible are we being? Your managers need to be on the same page for all of that. Because what you don't want to have happen is have your managers say, oh yeah, I think this is frustrating too. Or yeah, I, I hear what you're saying, this doesn't work. You want them to be on board and understand the reasoning behind what you're doing so that way they can help to get your employees on board and understanding the value of what you're doing, the return to work that you're putting in place is for the company. So ensure your managers know how to appropriately respond to employee concerns. Again, they don't have to agree with them, but, you know, they can say, thank you so much for telling me. They can say, you know, I'm going to bring that up. I appreciate that. And if they know all the reasons as to why protocols are being put into place, as to why you have the limits on flexibility that you do, whatever it is, they will be able to manage situations with employees' fears and concerns in an appropriate way that does help to create the space for psychological safety where employees can feel like they can speak up and be heard and have productive conversations. Um, I would also really encourage you to set expectations for how often your managers check in with your employees. Um, again, this is something that we've seen across the board for the past few months is managers need, even if people are still working remotely, managers need to be checking in with employees on a regular basis. We wanna help to keep that sense of community and the sense that your managers and as a company, you support your employees as people, not just as employees and workers. So make sure that those conversations that would happen naturally if we were in the office and able to all be in the lunchroom or walk through the hallways together as we normally would, where we might say, hey, how you doing? How, how's your family? Or I know you mentioned something the other day, I wanted to check in, how are you doing? Those things aren't happening as naturally. So set an expectation for your managers on how often they check in one-on-one -on -one with each of their employees and tell them to not just say, you know, oh, when's that, how's that report coming? But give them the space to say, how are you? Is there anything that I should know? So that way employees can bring up issues that they may be having. Um, equip your managers with the resources to share with employees who express concerns. So if there are, if you have an employee assistance program, make sure your managers have that information. If you have additional resources, maybe through HR or your insurance company that you want to have available for your employees, make sure your managers have it, understand how to use it and how to refer to it. And help your managers see their role in the organization's success. Um, this is a big piece. And this goes again to creating that sense of safety. People are really overwhelmed. They're very stressed right now. 
And it can be really easy to fall back into that mindset that I'm just a cog in the wheel. And you want to really make sure that your managers feel empowered and that they understand that their success is your success. Their team's success is the company's success. And I don't think that's ever been more true than it is right now. And the more that you can make your managers feel valued and you can include them in decision making and train them on all the changes that are going to be coming up and give them the tools to be able to support that change effectively, that's going to go a long way to your employee success and the overall organizational success because they're going to feel empowered and you're going to be building their morale. So training management is something that sometimes gets brushed under the rug. But I think now more than ever is really when we need to be focusing on this. Because if you can bolster your manager, you'll be able to bolster the rest of your team. Um, and Jason, I think if you want to advance to the last slide, that's it. <laughs> so, um, you know, we really encourage you, if anyone has questions about uh, psychological safety in general or addressing employee needs, Julie and I are happy to answer them. Uh, Julie, I don't know if there's anything that you wanted to add. Yeah, I, I echo that, that you can feel free to reach us, reach out to us directly. Um, you know, certainly you can reach out to uh, your prestige business partner if you have any questions about our services as well. Um, and really, you know, thank you, Jason, for inviting us here today. Um, it was a pleasure presenting with you. Yes, thank you both, Erin and Julie. Um, I, I do have to say, you know, to, to you guys, to everybody on the call, you know, I, I've been working with National EAP. Prestige has obviously been working with National EAP for quite some time. For the seven years that I've been here, um, I've been working very closely with National EAP. And certainly the, the partnership dates well before, you know, I came to Prestige. But I, I do have to say I think we work very closely and very well together because I think we share a lot of the same values. You know, we care about our clients. We care about the employees. Um, we want to get back and be extremely responsive to our clients and truly help out. And we really have found a, a true partner in National EAP. In fact, I know that there's some clients on the call right now that could probably also sing the praises of the support that National EAP has, um, has done and what they put forth for their clients. So I do appreciate you spending some time with us this morning to, to go through some of the things some of the support that you provide to clients, and I look forward to partnering with both of you more in the future. Thank so, you, Jason. Thank you. You bet. So moving on, what I'd like to talk about now is certainly a hot topic. It's um, around the world of travel advisories, and if you try to keep track of this, um, it might make you dizzy, and, and I'll explain why over the next uh, set of slides. But really, this is in response to the increased rates of COVID-19 transmission, obviously in certain states, many of them within the United States. And many states and counties, localities, have offered you know, their own travel advisory guidance. Some states have even implemented requirements that are punishable with fines if you're found to be breaking those guidelines. So <clears throat> with the, the COVID and the pandemic and the surges that we see in certain areas, more and more states are coming out with these rules. And again, it's all within the, the guise of keeping everybody safe. So I will be taking you through some of the more recent updates over the next set of slides. Please remember that these advisories change very, very frequently. These slides they're about to show you were created on Tuesday morning, and I had to update them with changes as late as 11 p.m. last night. So that's why it's extremely important to stay up to date with your state or locality travel advisories, because what you know in the morning could very well change later on that same day. So, <clears throat> With that being said, the first couple of states that I want to take everybody through is Illinois and Pennsylvania. At this point in time, there are no statewide restrictions for the actual state, the entire state of Illinois. However, there remains to be for a 14-day quarantine for anyone heading to Chicago from the 23 states you see listed under that bullet point. You are going to notice that the 14-day requirement or the 14-day quarantine is going to be a standard time frame from state to state. You'll also notice that the list of states tend to be very similar. I will not be reading off all the state names, 
on each bullet point on each slide um, because there are many. And it's also important to note that the, that the Illinois list is scheduled to be updated every Tuesday and those changes will be effective for the following Friday. <clears throat> Moving down to Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania recommends that if you have traveled to an area with a high number of COVID-19 cases, you should, again, quarantine for 14 days. And as of August 6, Pennsylvania has a travel advisory for the 23 states that you see here. So let's move on to New York. And New York has so much that I've given New York two slides. So as we move over to the state of New York on August 4th, New York revised its travel advisory list. The quarantine applies to any person traveling from a state with a 10% or higher positive rate of COVID-19 cases, of course, over a seven-day rolling average. Now, New York does continue to be quite vigilant with their repercussions, probably one of the more vigilant states in, in, in the country about their rules. The state plans to find certain travelers who leave airports in the state without submitting a form that says where the travelers are arriving from and where they're going to, and this fine could amount to a hefty $2,000. This brings us to the COVID-19 traveler registration. As of the 5th of August, New York City has added checkpoints in key entry points into New York City and extended it to Penn Station as of August 6. The checkpoints are being set up to enforce the New York State travel quarantine orders. And using these checkpoints, travelers who have visited the 35, or I believe now it is 33, designated advisory states or territories will be given information and a New York State Department of Health form to complete regarding the 14-day quarantine period. So as I move over to the next slide, I wanted to present to everybody the updated list of the states on the current travel advisory for New York. And of course, and we'll discuss this in a little bit as well when we reach other states, but New York has partnered with New Jersey and Connecticut for their travel advisory initiatives. Now, as I mentioned, given the sheer amount of states that New York has on their travel advisory list, I felt that it earned its own slide. And uh, that's really because I ran out of room on the previous slide. So, so as I mentioned earlier, changes are being made constantly. Just last night, Alaska, New Mexico, Ohio, Rhode Island, and Washington were removed from the travel advisory. However, it's important to note that the state maintains that individuals in quarantine after traveling from a state that has been removed from the list should continue to quarantine for the full 14 days. So we're not getting around the quarantine. <laughs> um, also important to note that Hawaii, South Dakota, and the Virgin Islands were added to the advisory list as of yesterday. Moving on to Maryland. The state recently issued an updated out-of-state travel advisory that, quote-unquote, strongly recommends that all residents refrain from non-essential travel outside of the state. Now, people arriving from another state are encouraged to either get tested within the 72 hours before departure in their state or when they arrive in Maryland, in which case, of course, they should self-quarantine while they're waiting for the results to come back. Also, Maryland residents that return from any state with a COVID-19 test positivity rate of 10% or higher, except with the exception of Virginia and D.C., they should, and I say should in quotes, get tested and self-quarantine at home while awaiting for the results of those tests. I'm going to move on to Massachusetts. Our friends up north, our Patriot fans, they also tend to be one of the states with more strict rules. Uh, a new order was put in place as of August 1st that requires all arrivals, including residents, to complete an online travel form upon returning to the state. So like many states, travelers, again, must quarantine for 14 days or they can produce a COVID test result from a sample taken up to 72 hours prior to their arrival in Massachusetts. Along with New York, they also have fines. Failure to comply with this directive could cost someone up to $500 per day. 
If you want to avoid quarantining for two weeks in Massachusetts, then you can get a COVID test at an approved center within the first 72 hours of arriving in Massachusetts. But again, you must isolate until they get their test results. Travelers from low-risk states are exempt from both the form and quarantine requirements. This means that they meet both of two separate criteria. The state they travel from averages daily new case numbers of less than six per 100,000 people and has a positive test rate below 5% as measured on a seven-day rolling average. Now, as of August 4th, the lower risk states include Connecticut, Hawaii, Maine, New Hampshire, New York, New Jersey, and Vermont. Uh, Rhode Island was just recently removed from that lower risk states. Moving on to the last two, we just have two more states to cover in this section. Uh, Connecticut is next. As you may already know, and as I mentioned earlier, Connecticut has entered a partnership with New York and New Jersey in maintaining a joint travel advisory, which applies to persons entering from high-risk states, a list of which is continually being updated. The list that, uh, of the covered states that they share with New York and New Jersey is covered under the slide that has the New York states. So the travel health form is another method being used by a number of states. You know, anyone traveling from one of the high-risk states listed on that New York slide uh, must also fill out a travel health form. If this rule is not followed, it could potentially result in a $1,000 fine and mandated quarantine completion. Lastly, according to the guidance from the state, the travel advisory does not apply to individuals traveling through designated states for a limited duration of less than 24 hours. So just driving through a state would not qualify you. It would not make, it does not apply to those individuals. The guidance lists examples of a quote unquote brief passage to include stopping at rest stops or layovers for air, bus, or train travel. So um, again, it's just important to know that just passing through, you know, doesn't qualify you under that section. So lastly, I wanted to move over to New Jersey, which completes the trifecta for New York, Connecticut, and New Jersey in their tribal advisory team up. Um, so again, New Jersey is partnered with New York and Connecticut. They maintain their joint travel advisory. The recommendation for New Jersey's incoming travel advisory is for a 14-day quarantine. I know you're all seeing the, the common theme here and the trend. So the 14-day the 14 quarantine for all returning residents and visitors coming from areas with a positive COVID test rate of more than 10 in every 100,000 people or a positivity rate of 10% or higher, again, based on that seven-day rolling average. So going back to your high school math, when you say, I'm never going to use this in the future, why do I need to learn this math? Well, in the world of pandemic, we are using math. So. Um, and, and again, as the state's advisory so eloquently put, the self-quarantine is voluntary, but compliance is expected. Now, New Jersey also asks that inbound travelers from the affected states to provide information about where they've been and their intended destinations via an, uh, via an online voluntary survey. And this is really to, uh, to help aid the tracing events. The online survey can be found at the COVID-19 section of the New Jersey State website. So that wraps up the state-by-state -state section. I, I will say that we've had a lot of questions asking about, of course, not just New York, not just the tri-state area. We're trying to get as much information out to everybody as possible. So we really wanted to select the states that had the more stringent, strict rules regarding travel advisory. But as you've seen, there are so many states. It really, the lowest number of states that we've seen on the travel advisory list is 23, and it goes up to, as of yesterday in New York, it was 35. And at that point, why don't we just make it the entire country? But again, the idea with each one of these states is to keep everybody safe. So I, I will say, and I do want to reiterate, that all of these rules, all of these states, they are constantly changing by the day. So if you do have plans, if you do want to educate employees or yourselves, please keep, keep an eye on your state websites, keep an eye on the 
the, the government website countrywide for straight for, for advisories. And please reach out to Prestige and your HR business partner where we can help guide you even further along those lines. With that said, I am going to pass things over to Carol, who's going to talk a little bit about some legislative updates as well as the PPP loan forgiveness reporting. All right. Thank you very much, Jason. Um, as you all may have heard in the news, President Trump's been uh, quite busy uh, uh, over the last few days. And so I'm going to briefly discuss the four executive orders that he signed on Saturday, um, starting with the easiest and getting to the most complex uh, as I go through them. Um, one of them requires the Health and Human Services um, head Alex Azar and CD Director, CDC Director Robert Redfield to consider whether a continuing ban on evictions is needed. So they will start those conversations. Don't know what will happen with it. The second one um, waives the interest on federally backed student loans through the end of 2020 and allows borrowers to delay payments through 2020. I believe the payment delay uh, applies to all student loans because many children have loans outside of the federally backed loans, uh, but the interest waiver is only on the federal loans. The third one is uh, an attempt to restore some of that additional unemployment money. Um, as Andy had mentioned earlier, the uh, House still wants $600, the Senate wanted $200, so the executive order has $400 for the period of time beginning 9-1 and ending on December 6th. But they did put a budget on it. Uh, it's indicated in the executive order that only $44 billion has been set aside. Uh, based on current unemployment, that gets us through about five weeks. Um, also, as Andy mentioned in the beginning, the, the signing of these executive orders was to spur some, uh, incentivize the Congress, both House and Senate, to get back together and get to the bargaining table and start conversations again. Um, as of today, that has not occurred. And so we will then go to the next slide to talk about the fourth executive order, which is you have to be careful on, on what you hear in the news because I have seen this actually referred to as a payroll tax credit, and it is not. So let's go through the specifics. First of all, this implies to employees making up to $104,000 a year. Uh, it did talk about $4,000 on a weekly basis. Um, so the, the math will get complicated, I'm sure. But they are eligible to defer, not be forgiven, not get away from, but defer their FICA tax withholding for the periods of September through December of 2020. And that is just the FICA, the 6.2%. The Medicare tax has not been touched in this. But here's the, the devil is in the details. There are no details on how the employees would pay the tax after the deferral. Um, you know, for instance, it could be on your 2021 personal income tax return, that it all becomes due payable then. So this isn't uh, giving people money, it's what I like to call kicking the can down the road, although Trump has made some statement that if he's reelected, he's going to try and have this debt forgiven. Um, there's also some speculation that the employer, should they offer this to their employees, and once again, it's not necessarily mandated that it be offered, that the employers might be on the hook for repayment if the employees don't pay it. So everyone needs to think carefully before jumping onto this. And as I said, it's not clear if employers are required to offer. And we're waiting on Secretary Mnuchin to give us the details on how this is to be handled, who has the liability, how is this reported, when are employees supposed to repay it. And essentially he has, um, 18 days to get that done, uh, because this starts on September 1st, uh, 19 days, uh, starts on September 1st. So we're going to have to await more details. Again, if the House and Senate get back together and they can uh, agree on the next COVID bill, I think we're calling it 4.0 now, possibly, then all of these could possibly go away. 
You can't get through a webinar at Prestige without talking a little bit about PPP loan forgiveness. And I'm, I'm going to go off topic a little bit from the slide because of some additional information that came through just, um, I learned about just this morning. The SBA has opened their forgiveness portal. And, and that has caused a lot of you to go, whoa, I, I need to apply. First of all, please remember, you have 10 months from the date your covered period ends to make that application. And what it's, it's forgiven any interest that could have accrued during that period of time is also forgiven. Um, also, as much as the SBA has opened their portal, I have checked with the websites for both Wells Fargo and uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, and Chase was the uh, largest um, PPP loan uh, lender in the program, have not opened their portals. Um, Wells Fargo is not giving a date, and J.P. Morgan has said, eh, late August, early September. So again, I know you're all anxious to finally close the book on this and know what your forgiveness amount is, um, but there is no rush, and it, both of those banks specifically stated they're waiting because SBA keeps giving new guidance. Um, specifically on August 4th, 4th, they released a whole new set of uh, frequently asked questions that gave us further clarification on costs associated with owner employees. So we are taking that into consideration as we write our forgiveness report. Again, our forgiveness report is not going to be just a dump of information from Prestige Pro. It's going to be itemized, categorized, put on the right line. The last um, sheet in the Excel file that we will be giving you will look exactly like your Schedule A. You will be able to copy the numbers down, print the spreadsheets as your backup to show the expenses per employee for all of the different topics. Um, so it's, it's a large undertaking. And this slide addresses the fact that we ask that you go through your system and please make sure that your owners are flagged accordingly. There is a separate field in the Prestige Pro system that designates somebody as an owner. Uh, putting their job position or their job title as owner doesn't flag them as such in our system and therefore categorize their wages, their benefits, their 401k, or their taxes appropriately so that everything gets put on the correct line. Um, as of uh, we anticipate, so once again, you're all looking for a date. Those questions have started to come through. Um, August 21st is the date that we have set that the reports, and I'm still going to say should, because this is a, a large project. It is going to, I've, I've seen the reports that some of our competitors are putting out, and it's not nearly as thorough as what we are handing you to complete your applications. What can you do in the meantime as you await these reports? Well, on the application, the, the, the first page, you are going to need to provide your mortgage payments, your utility payments, all of those expenses that are outside of payroll. And so you can spend time now getting your canceled checks, getting your utility statements, your bank statements. There's a lot of things you can still get done to work towards your forgiveness application as we put the finishing touches on your report. And um, I thank you all for your patience. And we'll be back next week, I'm sure, with either hopefully a deal between the House and the Senate, or Steve Mnuchin will have given us details on how to uh, implement the executive orders. Thank you, Carol. Yes, no shortage of information to bring out to the masses here, so I appreciate you putting those slides together. What do you say we wrap up with some frequently asked questions? I, I will say I give many thanks to our wonderful clients on these webinars, as well as the HR business partners here at Prestige for supplying us with these questions that come out to um, our clients and you, the attendees here on a weekly basis. So you all have a participation in this process and I am grateful for it. So let's, let's get on with it. All right, and so since most of these are client services type of questions, I get to ask the questions and Jason gets to answer. Oh boy. 
All right, if schools continue remote learning in the fall, will employees be entitled to the FFCRA leave? Yeah, we get this question a lot, and, and obviously we're dealing with returning to work, child care issues, what's going to happen in September. But for this question, the short answer is yes, right? The, the leave benefits under the FFCRA aren't going away right now, and employees are still, they will still be entitled to the FFCRA leaves. So it's important that employers get in front of this and work with their staff to figure out how schools, how their reopening plans will impact their staff's work schedules. Options include maintaining remote work, working around school schedule for intermittent leave, and of course adding flexibility to hours worked. All right, thank you, Jason. Can I force older at risk employees to stay home? Tricky question. Um, it's definitely a tricky, quest, tricky question, and I can see this as uh, potentially coming from a good place, you know, like a lot of the stuff that we advise on here at Prestige. Uh, the reality is the EEOC has advised that employers excluding someone or treating someone different due to their age are in violation of the Age Discrimination Employment Act. However, on the local level, certain sick leave laws do require an employer to reasonably accommodate those who request COVID-based accommodations based on age. So like with everything else, it is always advisable to enter into a good faith discussion with the employee prior to making these types of decisions. Thank you. All right, now that our employees are back in the office, um, how do we handle a positive test result? Yeah, uh, really relying on the CDC at this time per their recommendations, the employee should be sent home immediately. Uh, and they really should not return until released by their medical provider with that release. In past webinars, we've definitely discussed how to handle these types of situations and prepare for them. All employees that work closely with the employee should be sent home as well. The CDC defines, quote unquote, closely as within six feet from each other for periods of 10 to 30 minutes or longer. The individuals working near the employees should follow the recommendation of consulting with a health care provider. So again, just, just to reiterate, the employees should be sent home and I, I would hope you know, that we have protocols in place on how to handle this so that you're not surprised by it and have to maneuver things around. All right. My employees <laughs> travel to a state that requires a 14-day quarantine. Do I have to pay them? Yeah, possibly. It really all depends on the eligibility for uh, and prior utilization of the leaves under the FFCRA. If the employee has not used the leave benefits under the FFCRA already, um, a health enforced quarantine is an eligible reason to receive pay under the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. And I will point out, since I am the tax person, that those pay codes, the FFCRA pay codes, generate a tax credit for the full amount of the wages. So that's where you can help an employee by giving them the pay and not having it hit your bottom line for someone who isn't able to work remotely. Look at that, HR and tax working together. So this one's for you, Carol. Um, if I'm under the 60% threshold for payroll expenses, will a part of my PPP loan still be forgiven? Yes, this was some of the guidance along the way when, um, uh, I forget where, when the first 60-40 split was released, it looked like a hard deadline that if you didn't meet 60%, you lost everything. The further guidance, the Flexibility Act indicated that no, if you're less than 60% of your loan amount on payroll costs, that'll just reduce your forgiveness, not kill it completely. All right, next question. Do I have to screen my employees daily for COVID-19 symptoms before they enter the workplace? So the simple answer to this question varies on the, I guess it's not so simple, uh, it varies uh, depending on what state you're in. While the CDC recommends it, some states actually go a bit further and they do require it. Uh, with this type of question and depending on the state you're in, whether it's state or even locality, we do recommend that you speak with your HR business partner to help determine, you know, your, your workplace practices as your employees return to the workplace. All right, last two questions we have here. 
can I test my employees for COVID-19? COVID-19 tests are permissible under the ADA. This is according to the EEOC. As it is job related and consistent with the business necessity, that's really where you should be testing for and those are the rules that you should be following. So again, as we like to say, as I get the answer out there for you, we do recommend that you consult with your HR business partner to help determine the best course of action regarding this. All right, and then the last kind of test, how about the antibody test? No, this is not required, uh, and, and, it, and it shouldn't, you know. We, we want to go far, but there's only so far that we do want to go and be invasive, but the CDC does state that antibody test results should not be used to make any decisions about returning an individual to the workplace. So like anything else, you know, let's be smart, let's talk about it, let's be careful about the decisions that we are making. We don't want to get into any potential discriminatory situations. Um, and I understand that can be difficult when we're also trying to balance the health and safety of our employees. So please reach out to your support staff here at Prestige so that we can help guide you through these questions. And that wraps it up. <clears throat> I do appreciate everybody that um, took the time out this Wednesday and all the previous Wednesdays to join us on these webinars. I'm glad that we're able, <clears throat> pardon me, I'm glad that we're able to bring all of this information out to you and I do appreciate the information and the questions that you bring to us. It definitely helps to have a thoughtful and provocative type of webinar for everybody. Again, I do urge everyone to visit the COVID-19 Resource Center on the, on the Prestige website that is constantly dated, not just with the slide deck and recording of these webinars, but any information that you might need or find useful as you're managing through the COVID-related reality that we're currently in. Stay tuned for future webinars. We will invite Seth and Malcolm from the Groom Law Group again in, in, in the coming weeks as we Continue to update everybody on everything COVID related. And with that said, I hope you have a fantastic Wednesday and the remainder of your week. And I look forward to speaking to everybody again next Wednesday. Have a great day.